with a quote, actually, because it's something, well, first of all, you are one of the most articulate filmmakers about your own work. So it's, it's always intimidating to converse with someone who is a better critic, great thinker, knows exactly what he is doing, and I think that is you. Um, I was that. I don't know if I still uh, will see. We, on verra. Yeah. I think so. Um, but just a quote for all of us to think about um, during this conversation, and it's something that I think about a lot when I see each of your films, and you had said, I think of human beings as a strange mixture of the physical and the non-physical, and both of these things have their say at every moment we're alive. And I think that this is so prescient in all of your work. Do you still feel that way? Uh, yes, I would say so, even more than before, yeah. Uh, it's um, the uh, mantra in my last movie, Before the Shrouds, was uh, Crimes of the Future. The mantra was, body is reality. And that is my understanding of human life. It's very physical. And uh, I think that we are a body. And when the body dies, we die. That's it. And so that has really been the basis of uh, my understanding of, of uh, human life, and it shows in my cinema, I think. People have asked me why I'm obsessed with the body, and I say, well, <laughs> that's what we are. You know, if you're, if you're making films about the human condition, you must address the reality of the body. And of course, as a filmmaker, the thing that you photograph most is the human body. That's, that's the, your subject. Every, every, everyone, unless you're doing a, a documentary about moose in northern Canada, you are doing, um, you are photographing human beings and their bodies. So that's, uh, you have to be obsessed with the body if you're a filmmaker, even if you, you don't recognize it as an obsession. I think we have a number of film students here and aspiring filmmakers. And I think that it would be really interesting to go back to the origins. So uh, you just mentioned Canada. <laughs> We're both Canadian, so it's lovely to be here together, slightly uncanny. Um, but to talk a little bit about what the impetus for you to become a filmmaker, and I know you studied both science and literature at the University of Toronto. What was that moment where you knew you wanted to be a filmmaker? Well, I had always seen films as a, as a child, uh, and uh, one of the stories I can tell is that uh, w every Saturday in Toronto, you would have a whole flood of uh, a river of children going to a, a cinema uh, a in Toronto. And in those days, the parents weren't so worried about watching everything their children did. We would just be a lot of children on our own going to the cinema, and we would watch mostly American films, it would be cowboy movies or uh, uh, pirate movies and then cartoons and so on. And um, uh, I, I was growing up in a, a section of Toronto that was becoming very Italian. And across the street from the Pylon, which was the theater that I, all the children went to, was a small new cinema called The Studio. And it was only showing Italian films in Italian. And um, one day I came out of seeing a, a, a cowboy movie, I think it was The Durango Kid. I'm sure you don't know this uh, series of cowboy movies. And uh, I saw uh, people coming out of the studio, this small cinema that showed Italian films. And there were adults, they were not children, and they were all weeping, they were crying, tears were coming down their face. And I was shocked to see, first of all, to see adults on the street, weeping, crying, and I was especially shocked to, know, to think that there was a movie that you could see that would make you cry, and that would make you cry in public as an adult person. And I crossed the street to see what that movie was, and it was La Strada of Federico Fellini. And um, that was my first sense that a movie could have fantastic power to, of, uh, over the, the emotions of the viewers, because when you were seeing cowboy movies as a kid, that was not, that was not part of the dynamic. Um, I want to go back to your studies just a little bit, because I think it's, we can trace the hist the, your interests of both science and literature so profoundly 
in your work? And was that a way to sort of have them all coalesce? Your filmmaking, your interest in, in science and evolution, biology especially, and literature. Well, I, um, my father was a writer. My mother was a, a, a musician, a pianist. And um, uh, so writing seemed very natural to me. I used to fall asleep to the sound of his typewriter. And to me, that was therefore something accessible, something that you could do as a, as a person, as a grown-up you know, for, for your career as a writer. Um, and I always thought I would be a novelist. Um, but I was also interested in technology. And um, one day, at the, now we come forward to the University of Toronto, and I'm, I'm a university student. And I, I, I saw a film there that was made by a, a film student. It was called Winter Kept Us Warm, which was a quote from T.S. Eliot. And I was shocked once again to see my friends in, in the movie as actors. These were my classmates. It was a real movie, it looked like a movie, but my friends were the actors, not some Hollywood star from far away or a European film from far away. There was not a film business, there was not a film industry in, in Canada at the time. <coughs> and I thought, well, I, I would really like to try this. This is really interesting. And um, my inspiration basically was not Hollywood, not Europe, but the New York underground. Because it was the 1960s and the idea was you don't have to work uh, 10 years carrying film cans for some producer. You don't have to go to film school. You just get a camera and you get your friends and you get some film and you make a film. Now, these days, the, the, the fact that you can make a film with your iPhone makes this seem kind of, uh, kind of an ancient kind of problem. But in those days, access to film was not easy. And to make a film with sound was very difficult. You can do that with, with your phone. But in those days, you had to have a separate recorder. And I was really, really intrigued. And I wondered, how do you get the sound to synchronize with the picture? They're both separate. And, there's, and then that, that takes you into editing and so on. So I really was just curious. I wasn't really thinking of it as a, as a career or even a, as a way, uh, a method of creative expression. I was just very curious about the technology and so on. Um, and that's, so that those, those two episodes really are the basis of it. And then once I started to make films and started to write them, uh, uh, I guess my inner, uh, the, the zeitgeist of the times expressed itself through me, you know, and I started to make, you know, the films that I made. I think what's interesting about your involvement in that underground, and I think maybe Jonas Mekis or some of those filmmakers had come to Toronto. There were screenings, maybe the Kushar brothers, I'm not sure. Um, but when you started making your films, you actually shot them on 35 millimeter, which is not the usual route. A lot of people will pick up a Bolex, and I think that that has something to do with your vision or how you were semi-professionalizing what you were doing from an early stage. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I think it is. Um, when I first started to make my first little films, they were in 16 millimeter. But I did use a Nagra tape recorder, which was a very expensive, uh, you had to rent it, a very expensive uh, tape recorder that would synchron could synchronize with the, with the picture that you were shooting. Um, but at a certain point, and yes, the New York Underground was, uh, I think all, some of it was Super 8, and a, a lot, most of it was 16 millimeter. But I was really curious to, to use the medium that professional filmmakers used. And it's funny, I just, just thinking of it now, I had a 35 millimeter projector in, in my house. My father got this, it was a small one, and you cranked it by hand, and but it was actually playing 35 millimeter film. Very unusual. I've never seen it uh, registered anywhere, and it was a what I was seeing was a Mickey Mouse cartoon, one of the early Mickey Mouse cartoons. On 35 millimeter. Hmm? On 35 millimeter. Yes, on 35 millimeter. So I thought I really need to see what it feels like to 
And I like the quality too. 35 millimeter, of course, was better quality, bigger, bigger frame, bigger film. And so I shot my first two long films, Stereo and Crimes of the Future, which my first version of Crimes of the Future. I shot those in 35 millimeter, shot them, edited them myself, had my friends act in them, um, and so on. Yeah. And your themes were so early developed, I feel from those very early films? Yes, um, yes and no. I suppose when the, my first professional film, which is a film that I actually got paid to create, to write and direct, was called Shivers in, in, the, in Canada. It was called They Came From a Thin in the US. And um, that was a surprise to me because when I wrote that, I had no idea what I was gonna write. I knew I wanted to write a film and what came up out of the typewriter, it was before computers, um, was a, a, a genre picture, a horror film. And uh, Stereo and Crimes of the Future work, what would you call them? They were experimental, they sort medical of- medical fiction. Yeah, yeah, sort of, yeah. Um, so that was my introduction to the world of genre filmmaking and professional filmmaking was that first film. Um, and I wasn't sure, you know, the, the, the first, the Hysteria and Crimes of the Future, I did everything myself. This was a film where I had a producer, I had a, cr a crew to help me. I remember sitting around the table uh, before we shot the film at pre-production, and I had no idea what anybody did. There was a production manager, there was a first assistant director, a se second assistant director, I didn't know what they did, you know, I was really, and I only had, it was a 14 day shoot, it was two weeks to shoot this film, and uh, I had two weeks to learn how to be a filmmaker. That's what I felt like, that was the pressure. This film got a lot of press. It caused a bit of a stir. <laughs> the film was attacked for being a horrible, decadent, depraved film, all of which are good things, you know. I was happy about that review, but um, but it did it did uh, it kind of stalled my career for a little bit because the money that I was part of the money that I was getting for the film came from a government fund, and governments are tend to be rather conservative, so they didn't really think they wanted to put more money into the films of this depraved, decadent filmmaker. Um, however, eventually they did. And then I made Rabid, which starred Marilyn Chambers, who was a former porn actress. So they were justified in worrying about me, actually. 